Hello, and welcome back to Parlay. This is a show where you folks support the other stuff I make by paying me monthly to talk about the topic of your choice. And this Parlay is a continuation of True Mr. Foot's previous Parlay about how fish is made. I messed up in that Parlay and didn't read the spoilered out part that was you giving your input on the thing, which is half of the point of the Parlay. So True Mr. Foot, thank you for being patient with me while I correct that. Um, we're going to read the spoiled out part now. Uh, so it said, please read this part after you play the game. I did play the game. We talked about it a bit in that first parlay, um, and that'll be linked below if you didn't see it and you'd like to watch them together. Um, but here we go. Here's this part. Uh, Mr. Fruit says, How Fish is Made is a weird game. I sometimes felt like it was making fun of me. It seems like one of those games that has something to say, but I couldn't tell you what it's about if my life depended on it. I guess it's something like a meditation on the nature of decision-making, but why the presentation? Anyway, I wanted you to comment on uh, whether anything in the game matters, in the sense that the game is sort of nihilistic. What is the game trying to convey with this gross presentation? I'm pretty sure that you could talk about decisions without making it this gross. And did the game really need a parasite shaking its butt in my face while telling me not to worry about anything? <laughs> These are some <laughs> questions indeed. <clears throat> Particularly, I mentioned in the, the first part how the, the musical number part really put pressure on the game, in my opinion. Uh, that was the game trying something um, we could say bold to be generous, uh, where maybe maybe that pushed the game to its limits a little bit. So, we'll, But I'll talk about that a little later. Um, this is a question, to some extent, uh, about authorship, or you could view it a little bit about the game's lore. You know, we could be asking, uh, what did the people who make the game intend? And I do think that this is a game that is asking that question of the viewer. Um, people who, who wrote this game, if you didn't want us to think that, yeah, there's really nothing about this game that doesn't make the, the player think, why though, you know? <laughs> um, so that's definitely a question that I think is fair <laughs> for this game. There's a lot of literary criticism that is dodgy about investigating the author's intention. And I think certainly in our modern context, that is mostly invalid, like most things made um have some authorial intent on their sleeve, let's say that way. <laughs> um, not most things by a percentage, but a lot. That's my point. That's very common nowadays, especially, I, I would say, in video games. A lot of video games, uh, and this is where I'll start trying to unpack this situation, a lot of video games are, in my opinion, pretty uh, immature at their ability to depict a message. In other words, they hit you over the head with it, basically. They think this is kind of two reasons. The first one is that um, having sort of a ludonarrative combination, that is the story of the game is what you play, can make some messages pretty blunt. In other words, if you act out the message of the game by playing the game, that can make some types of stories or imagery or messages sort of maybe unnecessarily blunt and there's not maybe a lot you can do about it in this game you play as a fish flopping around in a machine now just playing as a fish is already pretty over the top like you there's not really a lot you could have done about that if you want some re not realism but down-to-earth fish controls that's ridiculous but you get the point um there's not a lot you can do if we're going to flop to not hit the player over the head with you're a pathetic fish you see what i'm trying to say so there's that but of course the thing that comes to maybe a lot of your minds is yeah the other reason that games have sort of immature expression of their ideas is that they're not written that well <laughs> um that's that's what's often meant by that but I, I don't think that's all it is again i do feel like uh framing a game this way if you're going to put the player in, you know, sort of different body, that's going to feel very obvious, you know, as you move around. And that that's a challenge. Personally, I'm not sure it would work if you then responded to that by making a game whose messages were very obtuse. I'm going to pause here before I give a few of my theories. True Mr. Fruit, you had a previous parlay where you talked about this idea that uh, badly made or badly delivered stories are sort of just better in a way and the idea of that parlay that's a gross oversimplification but the idea of that parlay you should go watch it 
is that um, basically because these stories are awkward or not perfectly presented, you sort of force the audience to engage with the piece because it's just inscrutable otherwise. You, it, the, the piece isn't giving you enough help to understand it, which sort of automatically encourages you to engage with it. Now, of course, in that parlay, we talked about lots of stuff like how the goal of every you know piece of work isn't necessarily to engage with it more. Um, and it can be belittling for people who just would engage with it anyway, uh, if it it's just not good at getting you to engage. Um, personally, I find this this principle quite frustrating. Uh, I feel like most things with a a big message are more awkwardly presented, and most things with less to say are better presented, which is frustrating because I want neither of those things the most. Um, I would like some some third thing. <laughs> um, but I, I do think a lot of creative folks are keen on the idea that getting the audience outside their comfort zone is very interesting. Uh, it is useful in some way. But I do personally believe it is a little bit of a, not a cop-out, not a crutch, but kind of those words. <laughs> Actually, kind of both of those things. <laughs> Actually, I kind of do think that. Anyway, so what what do I think? Um, but anyway, I wanted to frame it by saying, you know, I wonder if maybe that was not intentional, but something that the people who made the work would think, oh, it's kind of an asset to this piece of work that it's awkward or not perfectly delivered or whatever. Um, so, but, but, but let's be fair. Um, what is this work saying? What do I think? Uh, what are some theories about why it feels so awkward? Um, I, I don't know. I, um, Mr. Fruit, you said, you know, I, uh, I, it seems like one of those games that has something to say, but I couldn't tell you what it's about if my life depended on it. I didn't feel this way. Um, I, I actually don't think this is that impenetrable of a text, um, but I do think it's pretty awkward for a similar reason, I think, to something you say. Um, I'll get to that later. I think uh, the, the sort of revelation of what the story is doing is toward the end when you walk down a big lit corridor and the lights go on boom 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 as you walk forward and there's a an ominous fish who says this is it this is the big choice you know where you're going uh and there isn't really even a big choice after that and then there's another fish that says i i don't know if i can do this we're gonna go up or down oh it's this is all too much for me and then you just go in a shoot and that's the end of the game I think that's the game kind of playing its cards even more forcefully than it was before and saying this is the sort of pomp and circumstance and self-involvement of someone making a decision that is utterly trivial and doesn't matter at all. They have no real choice. It doesn't even really matter even if they could choose. And yet they they consider it from their frame of reference. It's sort of the, the most important thing, the penultimate thing, I guess. Um, like humans do, <laughs> I think. Um, to me, that part was effective in suggesting that we are similar. I talked about this a little bit in the, the first part, um, the idea that the game is trying to get us to feel like there's some similarities between our uh, ontological or sort of existential perspective and the sardines' existential perspective. Uh, and I think this part did a lot of that work, too. Um, it uh, It's trying to suggest that the sort of, I would say, self-centeredness that a lot of humans have toward their decision-making and lives uh, is also how the sardine feels in this sort of uh, caricature world of sardinehood. I think that a lot of the game's sort of abstract-ism, a lot of the sort of fish body part amalgams you see throughout the game the screens full of fish eyes and the weird fish part god that you see at that that dramatic penultimate moment with the lights turning on all the weird sort of fish gut monstrosities you see mostly on the walls of this game um are i think um there as a way to they're trying to sort of represent the idea of the sardine's life 
in a way that feels like the narrative of a human's life. Does that make sense? So obviously this isn't actually how a sardine machine or whatever would work necessarily, but it's been made in such a way as to sort of caricaturize or dramatize the sardine's experience in a way that feels like a human exploring a dungeon sort of halfway house with a sardine being processed by a machine to be eaten. That was my thought. Um, again, it is very explicitly not that. And also, at times, it explicitly is that. Um, we even get another moment where we see this pile of crabs that's just been dumped uh, in one of the rooms toward the end. And I thought that part was interesting. It's almost to suggest, as we go by them, we think, well, this isn't about crabs. Crabs can't talk. And then it's like, what are you saying? We've been playing as a sardine, talking to other fish. Like, what is this feeling of importance as we walk on the high street beside the the thing of crabs? You know, I <laughs> that's weird. Um, but uh, but I do think it's trying to suggest that it's suggesting a, a self centeredness um, to the way we understand other creatures ourselves. Um, that is what I thought it was trying to accomplish. Now, in the first part of the parlay, I talked a lot about the uh, I think what a lot of people would get from this game is a message about not eating animal products because they're disgusting, basically. This is often approached from the direction of meat, and then this one was maybe approaching it from the direction of fish. There are some parts of this game that I don't think can escape that, uh, but I'm beginning to think that that may be more a product of the game's messy delivery and not actually too much what the game was trying to say. Um, we'll get a bit into my theories about what what happened, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, I, um, I focused on that a lot in the first part. I don't have a lot more to say about it now. Um, but again, before we go on to maybe maybe why is this so awkward to sort of finish interpreting the game a bit, I think the, the main thing was sort of dramatizing the experience of the sardine. I talked about that. Let's just quickly lightning round other things. It seems like if we if we stretch, what might the game be commenting on? Definitely on consuming animals or like do fish have feelings? That's a thing. Um, it, the importance of decisions is definitely like a thing the game is commenting on, um, whether it you know, wants to be or not, maybe. Um, pollution uh, is a minor theme of the game. There's some, you know, uh, a six pack, you know, little plastic ring thingy that fish often get stuck in. Um, that is part of it. And the fish declares it to be their throne from on which they receive prognostications. I don't really remember what <laughs> that part was a lot of pomp and circumstance too. Um, so yeah, pollution, um, the health of the environment, um, just grossness, I guess. Um, this might seem to be the same thing as, you know, don't eat more fish or whatever, or the same thing as pollution, but I don't necessarily think so. I do think that um, when you, when you play a game that has, you know, gore on the surfaces and this sort of brutal environment and all these fish often with parasites or dismembered uh, or fish parts uh, falling from the walls or creating these crazy fish part golems it definitely has the effect to me in that short time the player gets used to that stuff to some extent um, so I do think that changing one's perspective uh, is uh, on sort of grotesqueness or grossness is definitely a thing this game commented on. Again, I'm not trying to say that this was the intended focus of the game, but these are things I feel the game pretty obviously, you know, did or was concerned about. Uh, I don't think most people who played this game would come away from it and then hear me say this game commented on pollution and be confused. Like there are, there's literal trash as one of the very few items present in this game like that. You see what I'm trying to say? I'm not sure that the game really cared about commenting on those things that much, but it definitely did, whether that was the intended focus or not. That's that's what I'm trying to say. So again, the sort of normalizing you to grossness may not be what the game was trying to do, but it definitely is a thing the game is effective at 
Uh, maybe not for everyone, but it's something the game it contains the, the pieces needed to do. Let's say it that way. Okay, so enough of that, um, but that's a little lightning round of things uh, off the top of my head that I feel like the game uh, does comment on, again, whether it intended to. So yeah, what's with the awkwardness? You know, in particular, I want to focus on when Mr. Foot says, uh, I'm pretty sure you could talk about decisions without making it this gross. Let's assume for a minute that the game isn't commenting on, uh, you know, not eating more fish because it's kind of gross or whatever. Let's assume, and a lot of people do interpret things this way, that, you know, the game magically can only have one message. A lot of people really do read text this way. Um, and, that, and that's fine, by the way. I'm not sure I think it's bad for texts to limit themselves to one message. <laughs> this game is a good case study on that. Um, but uh, but let's assume that. And then we will assume that the game is intending, the creators told you, we intended it to be a meditation on decision making, like Mr. Food is suggesting. And I do think that's you know one of the game's strongest themes, let's say. From the beginning, you're presented with the choice to go up or down, and the game sort of builds up the drama of how meaningful that decision is, even though people don't even know what they're deciding, and it seems like we matter literally not at all. Again, I think it's you know a metaphor for human decision making too. The game is sort of trying to say, you human, you have no more meaningful decisions to make than this. Um, so let's say that's like what the game is trying to say. Yeah, what the heck is going on? It's not effective to tell that story with such a obvious distracting secondary message which is it seems to be doing the thing where it's saying this is gross don't eat fish you know there's definitely some people eat fish all the time suggestion in the story um that's pretty unavoidable right and so because that's such an obvious direction to go in this seems a very poor format to tell to just talk about decision making in so why basically um so here's, here's some theories. First one, um, two-ish things to say, it turns out, that are just a bit ineffective to say together. In other words, maybe the creator thought that these, these messages have synergy, but I and Mr. Fruit, I think, think that they really don't. <laughs> the two things to say would be, yeah, the people writing the story probably do also want you to think, you know, maybe fish are just kind of gross. Um, and yet, uh, that is put aside a message that maybe the creators think is a good pair for fish are gross, maybe don't eat them so much. And, you know, d your decisions don't really matter. They're only as significant as these fish's decisions. I think the problem is that most people are going to think, well, fish being important is why I shouldn't eat them. They matter more than I treat them as mattering. But this game is suggesting that they don't matter, just like me. I matter as little as them, not they matter as much as me. You see what I'm trying to say? And so in my mind, I think the, the mechanism by which most people actually consider eating less animal products because of the animals rather than for sustainability, dietary, etc. reasons, I think most people actually choose to do that because they um, sort of empathize with the animal more. In other words, they sort of elevate the creature that is not a human to the way they think of themselves. Um, or they like never thought of themselves as being so different from the fish. Um, that's how I feel. Um, but do you see what I'm trying to say? And so these are two messages that I kind of get how that's related, you know, sort of in concept, you can see a creator of this type of thing saying, oh, you know, maybe it makes sense to talk about, you know, your decisions are on the same level as these fish's decisions. And so then maybe don't eat fish so much. But in practice, I think that w the, the game is asking the, the viewer, if they're to take both those messages, to elevate and reduce <laughs> the meaning 
of the text or the events, the fish, um, which doesn't really work like that kind of clashes. So again, to summarize uh, kind of a story where perhaps what's going on is that there's these two ish distinct messages that seem to have kind of synergy with each other. But in psychological practice, they kind of don't, I, I think, in a, in a sort of subtle way. And they might for some people. Um, it's possible some people would sort of get it uh, in a different way and then it would work. But I do think there's a clear dissonance. Does that make sense? So <clears throat> now, theory number one, I think, I don't know. I, I find it difficult to believe that this narrative is that, you know, the, the, the authors thought about it a lot, but didn't notice this quality. I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I feel like, it, you know, a good rule of thumb is always if we were able to come up with that in less than an hour total uh, between when I played this game to the previous parlay and then now, it's been less than an hour since I started experiencing this game and I thought of that thing. I don't know. I'm not some kind of auteur of literary meaning. They probably thought of that too, if they thought about it long enough. So... Here's an extremely judgmental suggestion for the second one, uh, sort of a creative selectiveness theory. This game doesn't look that good. It's not very feature rich. <clears throat> it's not a, <clears throat> how you say, beautiful game. <laughs> uh, in some ways, I actually think it is kind of fun looking. I think they did a good job with what's there, but <clears throat> but it's not an, uh, a, an incredibly well-produced game. It's not a game with a lot of money in it, etc. You could then say, well, the reason that it's got such an unfocused message is because they didn't need to think about it that hard because they didn't need to get much of anyone's approval to make it because they didn't make that much of it. There's not, there's not as much put into it. Now, this is sort of wrong on a technical perspective uh, before we can get to, did they just like not think about it enough or something? Um, you know, even though this is a production that didn't have maybe as much like development uh, oomph put into it, being made by only a few people, this type of thing still takes a surprisingly long time to set up. So I, I kind of refuse the notion that just because this is a sort of low spec product, um, the vision must be less focused because it didn't need to impress as many people or they didn't need to think about it for as long or whatever. Maybe if it was made by a ton of people and it still felt that way, it would be a place where you could say maybe they just didn't focus enough on that aspect. But I don't think that's the case, especially when it's made by only a few people. In fact, I actually think this one is the reverse. I think that this theory that maybe, uh, you know, oh, this game just isn't you know, such a focused product. Of course, it's a little janky. I think this is a vague notion a lot of people would have, but I actually feel the opposite way. I feel like the fact that this even exists, given its relative low specs, to me, it's almost as if to say the creators had something they wanted to say so badly that they even made this. <laughs> you, you could view it that way. Again, I don't think this is such a horrible game or anything. <laughs> creators, I'm sorry, that sounds harsh, but you get the point. Um, sort of the opposite of this idea. Um, no, I almost feel like that draws attention to what message the game is presenting. Um, it's at this point that I want to quickly read the Steam page for the game a little bit more. I didn't do this in the, the beginning parlay, but I do think there's a, a very small but useful detail um, on the Steam page. This game uh, doesn't contain a lot of text. You know, I think a lot of the time the the steam page for a game is not the most relevant part of it a lot of the time it is literally just marketing but this is a game where the text on the steam page is actually a pretty significant body of the game's total words you know um maybe 10 percent um just as a random guess so i'm now going to read you the entire steam page after a drink of water <clears throat> okay so in some awkward font choices, the game says, Do fish feel pain? How Fish is Made is a short narrative-driven experience about talking to fish and making choices. Okay, the game literally just told us what it's about, maybe. 
You are a sardine in a machine, but is life that simple? This place imposes on you and your fellow fish a prophetic choice. Will you help them or lead them astray? Will they do the same to you? Live through the ultimate power fantasy of being a sardine. That part was bolded. Make oily friends. Become upset. And choose your destiny. The sardines look just like the real thing, so you can really believe they have emotions. Guaranteed in italics. There's some bullets now. A wet and squalid, narrative-driven horror game about choice. A multitude of interesting and worldly characters to interact with. Warning, they may take your careless words to heart. A musical epic spawning philosophy, consumer education, and self-love. Developed by students as part of the Future Games Education in Sweden. Uh, and then there's a few of the creators. Uh, it's got an original song. All music in this game is streaming and YouTube safe. Uh, the content warning, etc. Um, so, uh, as you can hopefully see, uh, that is, you know, not a lot of words, but compared to the game's short text, actually pretty significant chunk of words. And the game makes uh, many claims. Uh, to the point that I feel like it's very fair to read the game as a major motivation is that it's meant to be not entirely a joke, but a bit of a joke. Like one of the major motivations we need to add is the game is not meant to be made as a serious production entirely. So some of the jank in the game can be explained by it literally isn't even meant to be communicating a serious thing. Um, we may be, from the perspective of these parlays, taking the game a bit too seriously. I'm sure the creators would be amused to see us literarily analyzing uh, this piece. But, uh, you know, fooey on them. That's a perfectly fair game. You, you wrote the thing. Um, again, I think that lines like, live the ultimate power fantasy of being a sardine, indicate that any sort of serious meaning the game might have is certainly attempting to live alongside, you know, those other meanings. And the game is uh, perhaps using comedy then, which I really didn't get, by the way, um, as, as a way to present a message gently, which I really don't think works. I think if, if there's one thing that I feel like failed about this game, to be critical for a moment, creators, um, I, I get the idea, I think, of making the game a bit... Um, ridiculous as a way to make it feel less like you're really pushing a message on the audience. Um, but I think that the up and down color coding, color swapping, the ubiquity of that thing in the game fails to not feel like you're saying, hey, this is a message we're trying to give you. Um, that sort of uh, level of focus I don't think worked if it was trying to take pressure off of the big choice by making it silly, I guess. Um, the bigness of the choice is, I think, meant to be part of the comedy in a way, but is also part of the message of the game. So again, there's there's a tension there. Um, there's a... Uh... Yeah, like not too much else to say, I don't think. Um, I, I wanted to highlight that um, the game definitely does back up uh, both of the sort of primary messages that we suggested. Um, the Steam page thing explicitly says that the game is a game about making choices, and it also says the sardines look just like the real thing, so you can really believe they have emotions, and warning they may take your careless words to heart. Both things I don't know if the game does that well, but, um, but that is definitely the game very explicitly saying, yes, we did care about those two messages, you know? Um, Finally, I'm going to say something really harsh um, now that we know that the game was developed by students as part of like a, an event, basically. Um, I think that this game covering these topics um, gained traction or, or further sense of import um, because it is about those topics. There's a very clear phenomenon in art uh, where, you know, if you cover something like this, well, it can be hard for, oh, I don't know what this event was like, but for example, judges to say no, because it's like, are you saying those things don't matter? Are you saying you don't care about the feelings of animals? You know, um, I am uh, really cynical, maybe more than we should cover in this parlay, about that phenomenon that uh, a lot of the time art is heavily selected for because it's 
like very quietly it's it's almost as if critics can't not pick it um a little bit uh i personally uh have a very unuseful perspective on these subjects i think about them a lot very habitually and so i often uh, approach them initially feeling like th this doesn't need to be said it should it's obvious that blah, blah 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 but it isn't obvious to most people like that's wrong it's just obvious to me my perspective is it's obvious to everyone that you know fish can be very gross or whatever uh, and it's all a matter of perspective and i think about that all the time i think about gruesomeness constantly and i'm sure a psychiatrist would have some things to say about that but to be blunt, I personally think it's quite unhealthy that people don't think about that kind of thing as much as they do. Uh, I think that to just completely go off of this parlay in every way for a second, most people's lives are defined by completely avoiding the things that bother them. Um, most people deal with uh, things that upset them by holding them off for literally their entire life and then dying before they have to deal with them. And that's also connected topic that you all know I care about a lot, why a lot of people don't want to live longer, uh, I believe. A lot of people are suspiciously averse to the idea of not dying <laughs> eventually. Um, they don't want to die now, but they want to have a time when their death comes. And I'm not saying everybody feels this way for that reason. I understand there's definitely other perfectly valid, by the way, uh, motives for uh, not not wanting to live longer or forever, but for a lot of people, it's because they, they the sort of unspoken reason is they have their approach to problems in life is essentially to just stall forever, <laughs> which I have the opposite of patience for. Um, in fact, I have a problematically opposite tendency to beeline my problems immediately, solve everything I can possibly think of now, um, delay nothing. Um, to the point of ineffectiveness, you know, like that's not an effective approach. Uh, but the reason I bring this up is just because this is a game that um, is not made for somebody with that mindset. It isn't like somebody who who is in bed with these subjects, um, who constantly thinks about the, the significance of their own decisions way down the line, um, almost obsessively thinks about that topic. This game is clearly not intending to say something that that is what I would be interested to hear. Um, and that's no offense or problem to this game. I have a perhaps problematic obsession with that topic. That is not fair to a game like this. Um, and so finally, I'm, I can't really effectively review this game because it, it just fundamentally isn't for my own mental perspective, in my opinion. But, but if I had to, I don't know. I feel like maybe this message is way more effective than we're giving it credit for if you don't have this perspective. Um, the sort of final thing I wrote in my notes is that we should consider the reverse. What if we treat this game as if it is quite literary? Like a lot of people give things a lot of credit when they're sort of established to be this important work, which I also have a gigantic pet peeve for. Um, but, but what if we did that? You know, what if we treat it as this game is considered a masterpiece? I believe you shouldn't treat it any differently for for that. But let's just say, uh, what if we went looking for what other people thought were the reasons it was treated as a masterpiece? You see what I mean? And I think if you do that, it clarifies that the game is not a masterpiece. Um, it is, but it, it isn't completely ineffective in some ways. You might be noticing that I'm uh, handily dodging discussing the musical number um, because I still don't know what to tell you about it. Mr. Food, I wish I had an answer for you about that, by the way. Um, I just, I really don't. <laughs> Why? Um, and it puts a lot of pressure on the game uh, looking kind of janky as well. Um, I guess it's fun, but again, that part really, really pushed on the, you know, don't eat fish thing to me. I don't know, a parasite too. Um, we humans have par- anyway. Um, <laughs> another similarity between us and fish. Um, but anyway, you, I guess my takeaway from that final point is just that I think that if you view the game as something that maybe is effective to a certain group of people, 
you could suggest that perhaps people who would watch things like Parlay, where you just deliberate on things for hours on end, here on the internet, staring at this guy's face, maybe we are not the intended audience for this game. <laughs> Just to be blunt, like I, there's no holier than thou here thing, by the way, how fish is made. Um, just because we obsess about things with no clear marker for why it will be useful to think about these things all day, that doesn't make us better because we think about things more. There's there's a lack of a value add there. Why are we bothering to think about things so much? I mean, I can tell you lots of reasons, but you get what I mean. It's not any better than anybody else just because we've thought about this stuff a lot. That means we're willing to invest a lot of effort with no clear value add, which is, you could argue, the very thing the game critiques. Gotcha. Um, the game is definitely saying, you know, people are sure deliberating a lot about something that they have no control over and which doesn't really matter at all, which is exactly what we do all the time. So yeah, for sure, it definitely is the same in that regard. But it's not from a place of anxiety. It's not from a place of having, speaking for myself anyway, any illusions that the things we're deliberating on are more important than they are. They're not, like I don't think they are. Um, it is a, it is a, I, I would say playful experience. I would describe parlay as a form of play to me, um, which it really isn't to, I, that's what I mean when I say the intended audience for this game. This is meant for a type of person who has a lot of anxiety about tackling the, the decisions in their life. And I, I would say I really don't, I feel a, a similar but meaningfully different way um, about that. So uh, yeah, I think that's all I've got. Uh, I, I went longer on this one because I feel like I did an imperfect job on the first part. And I did have a lot to say about this game. Um, I think that uh, if it's okay, I'd like to quickly say a note about Parlay. Um, you know, I, I relatively infrequently make mistakes in this thing I make a lot of, but I'm not surprised I made one now. And again, I'm sorry, and thank you for your patience, uh, Mr. Foot, for, you know, dealing with that. Uh, I'm happy that I got to continue talking about it. I had things to say, like I, I legitimately just forgot. It wasn't for wanting to rush it out. I just legitimately, it slipped my mind. Parlay is, uh, we've talked about this in previous Parlay, not a series about me trying to perform a certain perspective. It's trying to get just me to output a thing. And the, the usefulness or the interest of it uh, relies on the idea that I can output something that is that is interesting or fun to you with no preparation, just by existing which is the, the extremely arrogant sounding now that you put it to words like that. The thing about that, the reason I bring it up that way is that any sort of lack in my, in my life, basically, if I'm tired or uh, distracted, all of that comes out in parlay because it has to. This is not filtered or scripted or anything. There's nothing to hold on to except me how I am now. Um, and so I... Uh, definitely making a mistake like this in a parlay is a reflection of how I've been feeling lately. I There's a lot. Um, so I appreciate your patience. Uh, I you, Mr. Fu was very nice about it, by the way. Um, and just when this happens in the future, just know uh, I am more than willing to go back and not only fix it, but I want to talk about it more. Like, I wanted to talk about the that remaining bit. Um, I woke up knowing I had made the mistake, excited, legitimately interested to talk about it more. So please don't feel like you're putting more work on me, even though the reason for the mistake probably is because I feel like there's a lot on my plate. I, I like doing this. Like, please don't feel bad. I just, when this happens in the future, please don't hesitate to say. I know it might seem I would feel if I bought Parlay. Uh, initially, like, now maybe it's awkward or putting the person on the spot to ask you know, hey, you missed, you know, this part. I might not use everything in a parlay, but if I miss something this big in a parlay, please tell me. Like, it's embarrassing for me to not know, and I probably wanted to say things about it. Remember, I invented this job for myself. This isn't like I, I need to pay rent, so I went and got this customer service job, and like, this is just my job, you know, I'm stuck here, whatever. Keep in mind, like, I made this job up for myself. I invented this thing for me. I like doing this. Like you're you're not putting me out. 
Um, I understand there's a tension there, but I really wanted to say that at the end because I feel like when this happens, it it puts a lot of pressure uh, on the the parlay requester to again say or not say. Hey, I uh, I feel like you missed a big thing in this one. Um, obviously, be reasonable. Again, like I'm not gonna read every single word in every single parlay, and a lot of them there's a lot written, and a lot of you do say you don't have to read everything. Um, Obviously, there's time constraints too, uh, but you've all been really reasonable about that. So I personally think it's more important for me to say, you know, don't hesitate to ask. Okay, uh, Mr. Fruit, again, thank you for your patience. Hope you folks enjoyed it. Um, yeah, this this was fun. I, I like doing things like this. Um, I spent a lot of time in college um, as an English major talking about literature, but literature and also have you done that? Like, it's not a fun setting to do that in. Um, no one is interested in in taking risks and presenting a full picture because they're there to get participation credit, not to say an interesting thing about a thing. And you also blaze through texts way too quick because you can't quantify or sort of force people to have interesting ideas about a text. You can't make people dwell on something a long time if it's just some random text they have to have some interpreted opinions about, right? You, you, that doesn't work. That's not a good form of discussion. It's got to be opt-in. It's got to be a forum where you say, hey, if you if you have things to say about this, or you have things to say about everything, <laughs> um then then you know let's talk about it and that can be really fun of course um literary uh approaches to texts sort of interpreting a text can be really fun i think but the way you do it in school is the worst possible way to do it <laughs> um and so i'm a person who actually does kind of enjoy that just not at all what is meant by that in the context of education. I hated most of my education. Um, it was pointless. I, <laughs> um, I learned things, lots of things, definitely. Um, people should stay in school and all that. But, um, but the, the English, the pursuit of reviewing literature, the way it is framed in education settings is, I believe, almost entirely pointless. Um, it's something you would need to do in a setting that doesn't really exist for it to be valuable. Um, and, and I guess that setting is here or the Roman forum. I don't know. Anyway, 